Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Property. It's a webinar Wednesday and here we are once again with a great panel of people that we're going to be looking at the property market in South Africa and we're going to be looking at it in a slightly different way today. We're going to be attacking a subject that we have done on, uh, on Let's Talk Property some time ago and probably one that we're always going to be going back to, one that we have to revisit on a regular basis because the political climate is changing every single day. We're looking at what the, the impact of the political climate has on the property market and how it is uh, impacting this sector um, from, a, a, from, from, a, from a Let's Talk Property point of view. We're going to go quickly around the room and I'm going to introduce you to everybody but before I do that I just want to thank uh, all the team from Elan and the guys from REI <clears throat> for, for what we've been doing with the Let's Talk Property brand and sort of getting this together every week. It's been great to host it every now and again and it's really, really awesome that we can have the panel of people that we do and the time that they commit to, to, to sort of giving their insights. So without further, any further ado, let me introduce you to the team. I'm going to start with Andrew. Thanks Eugene, great to see you again. Uh, I think a lot of people will recognize me having previously been from the Elan Property Group and uh, more recently with Keller Williams. And a great pleasure to be on the Let's Talk Property show. I've recently joined uh, EXP Realty and bringing EXP to South Africa and some news in that regard. And I look forward to participating in this panel with the rest of the panel team. Thank you very much indeed Eugene. Well, Andrew, I look forward to a huge amount more information around the XP and I uh, look forward to you giving us some insights into that, so welcome. I'm going to move across to Erwin. Erwin's uh, no, no stranger to these webinars and he's always given us some great insights and some great uh, sort of talkable points. So Erwin, over to you to introduce yourself. Just Erwin, you're on mute at the moment. I'm Erwin Rode from Rode and Associates. And by the way, it's not Rhodes and Associates. It's an S, an extra S day. <laughs> uh, we are property economists <laughs> and property valuers and uh, <laughs> consultants. Um, and we are probably best known for our uh, Rode reports. We've got three Rode reports uh, and that's about it. <clears throat> Erwin, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for the correction on the spelling there. Um, so I'm going to move across to, to Ezra. Ezra is uh, no, uh, no slouch in these particular spaces. He runs one of his own webinars, and it's awesome to have somebody of his caliber on the, on the, the panel. And it's also good to sort of be able to cross-pollinate some of the ideas that we have and uh, that we've learned from each other. And I always look forward to watching the stuff that you're doing on your side, Ezra. So welcome, and if you don't mind, welcome yourself. Thanks, Eugene. I'm uh, excited to be here as well. And uh, my name is Ezra Rasit. For those who don't know me, I'm the founder of Infinite Property. We just help people build uh, personal wealth through real estate investing with various ways in consulting, you know, live webinars that we do since April. And um, also coaching, mentoring. We also have like an online university where real estate investors can learn how to invest in real estate. And I'm excited to be here with this team panel today and I'm looking forward to the session. Ezra, thank you very much for joining us. John, uh, John's been uh, with, with the economist at FNB. He's been on these uh, a few times and we've always enjoyed the insights. Uh, John gives us some very, very big talking points to leave with. And I think that he's always been nice and honest in terms of how he's uh, put the stuff across. So John, we look forward to hearing from you today and sort of some insights. So if you don't mind welcoming yourself, please. Thanks Eugene, I'm John Luce, um, property economist at FNB. Being at a bank and a big mortgage lender, I probably look more at the risk side of property or property markets as it builds up or, or un unravels. And uh, in that regard, politics and government economic, macroeconomic policy and the like is all very important um, and its interaction with the property market. John, well, thank you. And we really value your time and, and input. Pat, um, you, this is your game and uh, property is what you guys do exceptionally well. You live in a beautiful part of our country down the south coast. I think that uh, between you and I, we're probably going to have a lot of competition about what's better, the north or the south coast. But uh, at the moment, you're probably winning um, because you're a lot bigger than me and you, this is your space in terms of where you come to, to speak to us. So Pat, if you don't mind, just welcome yourself on your side, please. Thanks, Eugene. It's always a pleasure to join you guys. I come from the south coast. I am part of the REMAX stable. I own REMAX Coast and Country. And we're the largest uh, real estate company on the South Coast, but part of um, Remax Southern Africa. So um, a pleasure to join you and, and talk something that we, we love and we, we're proud to be part of the property business. 
Well, thank you very much. I think if we go through some of the points that we really want to try and, and, and look at today, um, we've been speaking a little bit yesterday is in, the, the, in the sort of the, the introduction and then this morning before we started, looking at some of the points that we really want to highlight, um, we want to look at the effect that load shedding has had on us or is having on us. We want to look at uh, what COVID is doing and has done. Uh, we want to align that to some of the, 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 the conversation around corruption around the leadership of where we are from a country point of view, looking at consumer, consumer confidence, um, looking at what's happening politically in the rest of the world as well, if we can get some insight into that area, uh, what the effect is, has, has been of the slowdown over this period of time, and then obviously some of the, the bureaucracy that we are involved in in terms of getting our job done. But before we go down there, I really want to give everybody a chance just to position themselves. And I want to go, I want to go around the, the, I would almost said room, but if I can go around the, 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 the sort of the webinar now, and just sort of start with Andrew. Andrew, uh, I mean, obviously you highlighted that you were part of the Elan Group historically, and you're, you're in a brand new venture at the moment. Um, I mean, there are they're, they're possibly good times to start a new venture, and there are probably tough times to start a new venture. I mean, I, I'd like to hear from your side. What is this new venture that you're involved in? Why now? And uh, if you can give us a little bit more insight into it, please, Andrew. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, yeah, EXP World Holdings, uh, situated in the USA, started in two, 2009 as a cloud-based company, technology oriented, and would be regarded as a disruptor from a technology point of view in the real estate business. Uh, I've opened a space or a real estate in not only USA, but also Canada, Australia, and the UK. And by the end of this year, we'll be venturing into countries, Mexico, Portugal, France, uh, South Africa and India. And I think EXP looks around the world in terms of creating a global footprint as they venture into new destinations around the world. And I think what is very important is that they move into buoyant markets where there is property movement from a commercial, retail, residential, from a rental perspective, and every aspect of uh, real estate where there's movement, there's buoyancy, and EXP will look towards those sort of spaces. I think what is also important is a deeds registry that operates. So if the, the deeds are there and the legal side and the legal aspect of a country, country is intact, uh, EXP will look at moving into those countries. So by the end of this year, uh, five countries we'll open up in, and by the end of next year, there's an expectation that we'll move into a further 15 countries. I think South Africa with a, um, contribution from property perspective of around about 5.3 trillion uh, from a real estate perspective. That shows how buoyant our market is and operating with some 48,000 estate agents in South Africa. So for us, a massive attraction. And I think we're going to bring uniqueness to South Africa. We're going to bring an opportunity for agents not only to earn commission, but also to earn revenue share and an opportunity for agents to participate in the shareholding structure of the company itself. Well, Andrew, thank you very much, and that's a good, it's a good introduction. Um, I sort of, I'm, I'm wondering now, and I'm, I'm sure from the, the audiences on the outside, from a confidence point of view with, with coming into South Africa, you've mentioned sort of how big the market is. You've mentioned that there is a huge amount of buoyancy in that market. Uh, the, the confidence and risk that you guys had to analyze before moving into South Africa, how big a role did the political climate play? Eugene, I think in any country, uh, political, politics is extremely important. Uh, any, anybody looking at investing in a country or moving in from a real estate point of view will look at this political stability of a country. I think what's vital at this particular stage is safety, security, uh, look at the environment, the potential of that particular country. But I think the biggest thing for South Africa is uh, EXP would have looked at it from a movement of property perspective. And there is genuine movement in South Africa. If you look at what's happened over the last six months uh, since the start of lockdown, and I think Pat will allude to that maybe a little bit later in terms of real statistics and real facts of property movement, not only from an entry level perspective, but all, all the way through to the top end of property in South Africa itself. So certainly politics does play a role. And uh, I think from a, a real estate perspective, what is the most important thing is where there's people movement. So if there's an influx of people into a country and there's an interest from an international investor point of view, that will make the property market more 
buoyant in South Africa. And unfortunately, over the last two, three years, there have been some very wealthy people extracting from South Africa, and it's created a bit of a gap at the top end of the market in particular. Well, Tommy, thank you for those insights, and we'll definitely come back to you and, and, and continue that conversation. I'm going to move across to Ezra. Ezra, um, you know, the game, the game that you're in and, and, and the, where, where you position yourself at the moment, I really want to understand from your outlook, are you seeing things in the property market presently as positive or negative? Well, there's a bit of both because the, the positive stuff is that, you know, the interest rates are reasonable now and then first time home buyers can be able to enter the market as well. And uh, as a millennial myself, I'm talking about a lot of millennials who having their money issue, like they're having the affordability issue to enter the property market. And we are a generation that's like money conscious as well too. So if you see like our property ownership in ASS is like 35% and is growing all the time. And I think it's also growing right now because of, you know, the banks are giving away 100% loans, they're giving money away for free. And at the same time, uh, you know, there's also good deals that are coming in the market. Like more affordable houses are coming in the market from, let's say, well-priced properties for investors are coming into the market right now because of what's going on with COVID. You know, people who are defaulting on mortgages, uh, you know, divorces that are happening right now due to COVID and a lot of other factors as well that are contributing into that too. But the negative part that I can say that is happening right now is that happens on the ground with, you know, transfers, the, the bureaucracy that happens with the councils, uh, the clearances that have to happen as well. You know, things are taking longer than expected. People who are building like long, like long term projects, like developers, you know, instead of you know, your application taking 18 months on a usual basis, it will take like three years. You know, it will take more. We actually don't know how long it will take for you know, your zoning to be done. Uh, we don't know how long it will take for other things to be um, happening as well. So there's a little bit of a delay on that too. And that's not helping with the demand that we have in South Africa for accommodation, especially affordable housing. Also, for student accommodation, there's a huge backlog as well that needs to be covered. And only, you know, investors and developers are the people who are responsible for building the economy. And uh, I don't think that's uh, a positive thing for, for investors right now. And if there's anything that can be done with that, it will be very, very uh, um, uh, uh, um, helpful, basically. Okay. And from a millennial point of view, and I'm glad you brought that up in terms of where you position yourself. Do you, do you, are, they, are they consciously astute or just consciously aware of, of what's going on in the politics at the moment? And how much... Are, are, are millennials allowing politics to determine the decisions that they are making from a financial point of view and specifically in the, in the property market? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. So I would say most millennials, are, we, are, we are right now political animals. Like, you know, at this point, uh, because of the COVID and what's happening right now, we ended up having to be, even if you didn't like it, you're only relying on the media and the politicians. That's the people who are deciding where you're going to be today. If you're going to have a curfew at nine, or if you're going to be somewhere, or if you're going to be having a drink on the weekend, or if you're going to be wearing a mask anyway. So that's what's happening right now. And that means that we have to actually face the reality that the politics are something that are affecting everybody's lives. And I think right now, um, it actually made more millennials conscious about politics, like politics and what's going on right now. And uh, also their votes as well, with regarding to, okay, what, what, where do they want to vote for? Uh, or, or, or who do they want to, you know, what parties do they want inside? that will be bringing better policies that will be allowing them to be able to invest. And um, also, you know, what, where they can get funding to get started as well, because that's something that's a little bit of a problem for most of the people who are getting started on the property ladder is, okay, where do I get the money from? So that's also something that um, um, came into play right now and is um, affecting a lot of millennials' decisions and making them political conscious. So I would say, answering your question in a, in a long, uh, in a short way, I would say that millennials right now um, are very, politically aware and they are also looking for like a better alternative in terms of what is the party that's giving them, you know, better policies. Um, what is the party that's not going to take a lot of debt that we're going to be paying in the long run? Uh, well, this is uh, the people that are, that are in power right now or the leaders in, uh, in today that are, are leading are taking all the debts and bringing it to us and we're going to be, I guess, we're responsible for paying for that in the long term as well. So there's a little bit of, 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 of looking at the future and in the short term, I would say, um, it, it, is, um, it is something that we were not expecting to see as well because a lot of my friends as well are like very, very political animals right now, very much political animals right now. They're always looking at what's going on with this, what's going on with that, because as I said, I think the current climate with the COVID and what's happening right now with the corruption and the stimulus and how we have to rebuild the economy is affecting everybody to actually be aware, politically aware and politically conscious today. Ezra, thank you very much. 
Erwin, I'm going to go across to you at the moment and just sort of, uh, you, you guys are intimately involved in putting some of the reports together that, that guide us and give us insights into where we are at the moment. From a, from a view for you within the property market, what are some of the positives and some of the negatives that you're seeing from your side and are there still silver linings within, uh, within the view that you have from your side? <coughs> yeah. It's difficult to think about silver linings, <laughs> except that, of course, when prices decline, as Ezra said, you know, then there are opportunities for um, picking up properties at uh, lower than 2019 prices. So that's just about um, the most uh, obvious uh, advantage of the current situation. Having said that, uh, it's my view, and it's not just my view, it's uh, quite a few economists' view, is that um, the current uh, recession which started before COVID-19, by the way, and COVID-19 was, was only uh, an acceleration of the downturn, by the way. Uh, this uh, recession is going to last, or this uh, period of low growth is going to last for many years. This is not a one, once-off thing, which uh, miraculously we're going to have a V recovery next year or something like that. Um, it is obvious that there are so many uh, structural problems in the, our economy uh, of which the, the debt of the government is uh, one of the important ones, not to mention ESCOM, etc., etc. Um, so uh, uh, there's no hurry if you are a buyer in the market. There's no hurry to pick up um, uh, cheap uh, properties at the moment. I would argue, uh, take your time and study the market uh, before you uh, jump in. Um, make sure that. Um, there's no hurry. Take your time. Okay, well, thank you very much. And from your point of view, what, what do you think needs to change in the current situation now? Apart from just time and sort of uh, allowing things to mature into where they are, are there things that we could do right now that the country could do or the government could do that could, that could f facilitate and force those changes? And what are those changes that you believe we could facilitate or, or at least allow to? Let me start with the changes that, that we have no uh, control over. And this is the, the fundamental problem of South Africa. We've got too few taxpayers relative to the total population. And on top of that, we've got democracy, and that's got serious implications. Uh, we saw that in South America uh, the past century. We saw that in Eastern Europe and uh, in Africa where the demands on the fiscus are too great because of expectations um, relative to what is feasible, uh, uh, practically speaking, uh, it means your, your politics are going haywire. Uh, politicians be become uh, short-sighted, only look at the short term and not at the long term. And, uh, and you get uh, serious forms of socialism and um, yeah. So we are lucky in South Africa, over 300 years, we haven't had coup d'etats. Uh, it's not part of our DNS. Um, and I ask myself, are we, when eventually the population's expectations exceed what can realistically be delivered by the economy, I ask myself, um, what are the chances of uh, coup d'etats uh, happening in South Africa? Um, I personally think the chances are low because it's, I don't think it's in our DNS. Um, uh, we're not used to this sort of thing, but um, certainly we must be realistic. There's a strong, a strong cap on, on, our exp on our potential growth rate in this country because of ESCOM and the Fiscus's problem. Okay, and I, th I think we're going to come back to There's going to be quite a few comments that I think you're going to weigh in on over the next while. So I'm going to move across to John. And uh, John, from a, from a banking point of view, I, I know business is seen as being fairly tough at the moment. I mean, it's tough uh, not only here in South Africa, it's, uh, it's tough, tough internationally with what's going on around the world. But is there still a good volume of business that's coming through? And what are you guys at the bank seeing in terms of the volume of business that's coming through? Well, so, um, surprisingly, at the moment, there seems to be. Um, it's, it's not, it's, uh, I'd say, it probably seems better than I expected just post-lockdown in this, this recent post-lockdown period. Uh, especially on the residential side, there seems to be a lot of activity. Um, the, the, the question is, firstly, 
how much of that is just delayed volume coming through from you know stuff that would have taken place in lockdown but couldn't and people that wanted to buy but put it on hold for a few months how much is that um, but it almost seems to be a bit more than that and um, I think that especially in the residential side the, the, the sounds are that especially young first-time buyers who are very credit dependent are, are, are buying and taking advantage of very low interest rates now because we've had some quite aggressive interest rate cutting. The question obviously is, is this sustainable? And um, I'm, I'm not convinced. I think that a lot of lockdown, the, the economic shock from the lockdown, a lot of that still has to play out. So if you take go back to the residential market, um, I don't think corporate retrenching is, is nearly complete yet. As a matter of fact, some probably haven't even started. It's a long process in South Africa. It's not like, um, it's not like in the US where you sort of 24 hours notice and security marches you to the door. So, um, you know, I think that's a process and the full impacts of the lockdown period will probably be felt over the maybe 18 months to two years or so. And can the sentiment hold? So you've got rate cuts, you've got a period where people who still have, you know, they, they haven't been affected by wide scale retrenching job loss around them. So they're feeling good and interest rates have fallen and they're buying property. Can that hold a number of months down the line when um, on the business side, people might see that post lockdown, their sales have only got back to 70% or 80%, not to 100% of what it was. On the um, personal side, people around you have lost their jobs in greater numbers. Can the sentiment still hold? And I, I'm doubtful. I think that this is a bit of a, it's almost like the Ramaphoria period where you saw a spike in consumer confidence and a spike in business confidence. And then when we realized that the new president was not going to fix everything in a, in a few months, um, things all calmed down again and sentiment deteriorated yet again. So, so I think this is a short period. In the longer term, I would concur with Erwin, there's, there's these huge structural problems. We're back to that lockdown. We sort of forgot about it for a while, but now we're back to that. ESCOM load shedding and all these drags on economic growth, and they're going to be around for quite some time. Okay, John, I mean, I, th I think that uh, we, when, we're, when, we're when we started off and uh, before everyone came online, we were referencing the GDP, um, and you were giving me some insights into that. I mean, the, the touted number of that 51%, that, I mean, it's a bit of an alarming figure to, to sort of hear and see, um, can you just give me a little bit of insight? I mean, I think you really, you really put my mind at ease when you explained it and you gave me some insight into that, into that number. You know, without uh, sort of having read too much, if you're just seeing the headline, the headline itself is, is alarming. Uh, can you just give us a bit more insight into that GDP? Yeah, um, quarter, quarter on quarter annualized GDP is, uh, growth is, or decline in this case is not a real number. It's uh, what, what it is is basically you, you take a quarterly growth rate or rate of decline and you annualize it, basically what you're doing is saying, if that was to continue for four quarters, in other words, a year, what would the rate of decline in total be then? It's almost like taking a 10 kilometer runner, runner's time and predict, projecting the time you would have done for a marathon. It's not a real thing. You didn't do the marathon, you did 10 Ks. So the, the, the actual number is nearer to 17% drop in GDP for the quarter or year on years, not far from that either. So that gives a bit of perspective. Now, now look, seven, 16, 17% is a big drop nevertheless. I don't remember that in my lifetime. Um, so it's still a serious affair, but no, the 51% the, the, the seasonally adjusted annualized rate is not a real number. That's not the actual drop in quarterly GDP. And yeah, with that in mind, I'm going to take all those positive thoughts that you've just given around that, because I'm going to go to probably the most positive person in the, in the, on the webinar here. And, I, and I'm almost sure, certain he's more positive than some of our audience out there as well. And Pat, we've, uh, we've had a chance to speak to you over the last while and some of the, the great work that you guys have been doing from Remax, and not only in your area, but Remax as a whole. Um, you are exceptionally positive. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you, you know, the message that you've given across uh, not only about South Africa, but definitely within the property market that we're in, is, is, is all positive. Can you give us a little bit more insights into that, please? Well, Eugene, you know, I'm listening to, to the discussion and I'm kind of getting a bit scared, you know, and I'm, I'm hearing, you know, don't buy, and, you know, it's going to be bad. <clears throat> well, let me put this on the table and just to put it into perspective. And I can only talk from, a, I'm not at Remax head office, so I'm, but I can give you the number. 
Uh, normally, we would consider 2.4 billion rands worth of sales per month exceptional as a business. And last month, we did 3.3 billion. Now, I can just bring it down to my little business. We're doubling what we've done. And we, we're, not, we're not massive. We've got 50-odd agents. We've got a couple of franchises. But I speak to my agents on the ground, and I interact with our clients continuously. And I'm lucky that I get around to all the, a lot of real estate companies. And at the moment, on the ground, there's some great work being done by the banks, especially FNB, who are really positive in giving lots of good loans out. And the, the problem we battle with is we battle with impaired credit records is one of the issues that, that are often being, you know, a problem with. And overcommitted, uh, you know, millennials. So overcommitted buying nice cars and suddenly need to start buying houses becomes a problem. But in terms of, you know, the, the, there's two economies. And I, I often sit back and I live on the South Coast and those that know it will know right next to me is the Nyugoma Trust land and all the reserves that are, exist. And I can assure you, the second economy in South Africa is booming. There are houses being built by the thousands, not by tens, by thousands, okay? And the first economy, we keep on measuring and telling us how bad it really is. And in fact, that second economy is not partaking in the studies that Urban might be doing. They're not really interested in the GDPs. They're not interested in the, in the, in the retrenchments that might be happening. I can tell you right now that the 7% interest rate is quite fantastic for buyers. They're flooding to buy houses away from the cities. There's lots of crime in those places. They want to get out there and they've discovered they can work from home. And they only need to go to the office every now and again. So I'm seeing that. And all, that's the picture I'm seeing. And I'm seeing it on the north coast of Durban, the south coast of Natal. I'm seeing it in Cape Town. It's massive. I even speak to my Joburg friends and they're having great sales. So I, I thought it would end in kind of June and that was good. Then July came, that was better. Then we came August, well, that was even better. And I haven't seen a slowdown in September. And so I, I can't be the one that's saying, oh, it's gonna be, I know it could slow down, but that's normal. That is normal. You know, um, it's quite normal that we'll, we'll have a slowdown. Um, I lived through the 26% era. People still bought houses at 26% interest rate. You know, people, once they understand what, what's good for them, they'll do it. So I'm extremely bullish. And Irwin, if I were to say anything to you, it would be, hey, don't wait to buy, buy now. Because I tell you what, we're running out of good stock. There's no good stock left on the market. Most of our good stock's almost sold already. So I wouldn't wait at all. In fact, the guy phoned me this morning, he wants to buy a three million rand property. We've got three, three offers on it and he can't get in. Sorry, unfortunately, it's gone. So I'm very bullish, and I long may that continue. And then from, from, from your lips to God here, because I, I, mean, I think that we all feel exactly the same way, I mean, especially in the property market, and we're always very happy to hear. You, you spoke, we spoke around the bubble, you know, and, I, and you sort of alluded to the fact that, I mean, I don't think we can see in the crystal ball how far this will go, and every no. month is getting better. I think that what, what, we, what we have to do from an industry point of view is make sure that there's stock. And stock is important. And how do we get those, those buildings done? And uh, we spoke about a little bit about that. In your area down the South Coast, is there, is there movement in that area in terms of buildings and, and, and the likes to ensure that there's stock going forward? No, not a lot. And, and the North Coast is also backing to get their stock. And I, I sit on a couple of committees where we look at all these things across the whole spectrum of Kaising with the Premier and the NEC. And of course, um, over the last couple of years, you know, the developments have stymied a little bit. And, but there are a lot of investors out there they want to get it going. And there's a bracket, you know, the, going into the lifestyle or retirement market. That's a lot of that going down. I mean, we've had some ones that are good like that. But um, I'm not too unhappy about that because there's still, there was a lot of stock around. There was still a lot of stock available in the market. And it's pointless bringing on new stock if there's, if there's an oversupply of stock. And that's why people don't develop. So once that gets taken up, I think we'll start to see that. So I'm not too unhappy that um, there's not a lot of developments happening. I mean, the North Coast is, is, is flying, flying with uh, new developments, and so was Cape Town. So there will be a little slowdown. I, I have no doubt about that. But uh, the banks are on top of that. They watch very carefully as to what the supply and demand is, and they'll give, they'll give um, money accordingly. So, uh, you know, from, 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 a, from a, 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 a real estate point of view who's just on the, in selling property right now, I don't want to look too far ahead, to be honest. And I know you can look into that crystal ball. And I, when I heard John say, unsurprisingly, or what should I say? He said, surprisingly, 
It's continued for longer. It's, it's more people were caught off guard. I, I, I've read reports where it was going to be absolute doom and gloom going to COVID. That people, there was going to be, you know, people were going to be dying in their thousands and houses were in, done buying the property and get out of South Africa. I read all of that. And it hasn't happened. And, and it surprised people, you know. Um, as, as surprised as I was yesterday, clicks, clicks with all their problems, the share price went up, you know. So it, that surprises people. So I don't want to look too far ahead here. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good time to just stay in the property business, um, you know, look for a good deal if you can. Can afford it, get into it. Okay, I'm going I'm to stick with a with a little bit more of the political conversation, just around uh, and and we touched on, um, on 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 building and developing stock, and specifically, I mean, we are the north coast and we're involved in a couple of developments up this side, and obviously there there is a huge amount of bureaucracy, and I want to go across to Ezra and start talking about some of that bureaucracy. Ezra, you highlighted. Uh, you know, yesterday when we when we met online for the first time, um, you know, you, you were quite prolific in terms of your position around that bureaucracy and, and what it is doing in terms of damaging the market and allowing people to to get building started. Can you just go back into some of that insight that you that you parted on uh, with, with, with yesterday and give us some more of that um, those comments, please? Hundred no, percent. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Eugene. So just to 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 comment on on what Pat is saying. Um, actually, a lot of millennials and people who are concerned about losing their jobs are investing more into property right now than ever. It's like there's a lot of people who are thinking, okay, I need to build a second stream of income. I need to have some asset base. I need to do something. So you're getting a lot of lot of people who are actually coming back into the market in a like in a surprising manner, of which we were expecting, as we were saying, like doom and gloom, and people not to be buying it participating in the market. So it's a little bit surprising actually. And also even um, uh, existing investors who are well informed and they're making, you know, they're looking to expand their portfolios. Also like investing heavily in the market because of the world price properties. As you said, the good deals are not staying too long on the market because everybody's just there looking uh, to expand and looking to take advantage of what's going on right now. And uh, at the same time, some people also realize that um, um, property is a long-term thing. In the short term, I don't think, I think we have challenges, yes. So maybe challenges from tenants' point of view. If your tenants are one of the guys who are affected by the like the industries affected by COVID, so you're gonna have to be a little bit more selective with the tenants that you're looking into, and um, um, also you know obviously the screening and and if the industry is affected by COVID because COVID you know has affected everything, it's changed everything. I don't think the world will go back to the way it used to be, and also some industries got wiped out entirely. So that's uh, from rentals and and and. Um, 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 uh, what do you call this, and, 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 and investor's point of view. But uh, just to answer your question in terms of the bureaucracy that happens in the council, I would say right now, you know, we have a lot of skeleton stuff, especially in Johannesburg. I think all the, the councils, this office opening and closing all the time. You hear that it's closed today, the next day it's open. You know, clearances are taking time as well. Uh, property transfers, which usually take three months or four months or five months at least, uh, right now they're taking longer than that. You know, right now it's like six months that you're like looking for transfer or even a little, a little bit more. So if you like uh, buying and you have a plan to say, for example, you're buying student accommodation and you say, okay, I, wanna, I want it to be transferred by next year and I need to be part of the academic year in 2021, then you must be a little bit more, um, I would say more prepared to wait a little bit longer than usual. You know, If you're looking to do your reasoning application as well, uh, that's going to be taking a little bit of time because now they're not working on Monday. Now this person is not there. Now this and this and the other. And now even the council is just making an excuse. The guys who are working there say, look, um, we don't have enough stuff and uh, this is something that uh, there's nothing we can do about it or we can't help you. So there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a delay and I don't think it's helping anybody who's, who's buying right now. But at the same time, those are the things that we have to deal with at the moment. This is the current reality that we, we have to deal with at the moment. From an investor point of view and also any buyer who's just buying property, you must just be ready to say that your transactions that are usually going a specific way, you must put in like lean way to, to you know, expect it to take a little bit longer. And also in project as well, if you're starting a project right now, you must know that, you know, some of the approvals are going to be taking a little bit uh, longer. And it would be good if the government could do something about that. Uh, even though I think yesterday when we had a little bit of discussion, I think somebody like Andrew mentioned that um, we are busy focusing on what's going on with the corruption, what's going on with the load shedding. I mean, right now, I'm not only building a, uh, a pandemic-proof business or load shedding-proof business, so it's like a little bit of that too, plus at the same time, there's also these delays that are happening as well. So it's like there's a little bit of focus there, but if there could be some focus on how to solve this thing up, I think it can really help as part of rebuilding the economy because investors are out there in the market looking to do deals, looking to help, you know, uh, uh, with the backlogs that is happening right now uh, in, in student accommodation, 
in affordable housing and all the other uh, um, um, demand that is there in terms of housing entirely in SA. So I think the, the government will do a better job if they can help and, and dissolve that sort of bureaucracy that's happening there on the market. Thank you very much. Good insight. Um, one of the questions coming through from Paul now. Paul's asking, what is the what is the impact of the political leadership having on the pop, on the property market? Um, and I suppose that's going to be quite opinion based in terms of what we believe that is. And I'm going to go across to Erwin and ask Erwin if you can maybe jump in and answer Paul's question there, if he's Erwin. Well, you know, everything starts with the economy. So the question should really be, what is the political situation's impact on the economy? It's the economy, stupid. Um, and. Uh, yeah, uh, a good case can be made that uh, politics is having a seriously negative effect on, on our uh, prospects uh, for growth. Uh, I don't think anybody on, on this panel would disagree with a statement like that. Um, yeah, so, uh, and because of that, of course, there's a knock-on effect on, on property. Property is very much dependent on, uh, on a growing economy. So uh, once you accept that the economy isn't going to grow, the um, logical implication is that uh, it's going to negatively affect the, uh, the property market too. And here I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking of growth in the rentals uh, and I'm thinking in, uh, uh, in terms of growth in, 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 in take up of space. Uh, so um, yes, everything is very hunky-dory at the moment. Uh, it's a bit like uh, the... Uh, what did the Germans call it just before the First World War? They invaded, no, the Second World War. They invaded Poland and then there was this, what they called the Zitz Creek. You're sitting on your bum and nothing was happening you know, until they suddenly then attacked uh, France uh, via the lowlands. Now, uh, we are a little bit in that situation now, I think. We are. It's, 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 it's the silence before the storm. Um, and the storm is not going to be necessarily uh, high level, but it's going to be long dragged out. Uh, uh, period uh, which is going to affect eventually uh, our property because it's going to affect jobs and it's going to affect uh, salary increases and wage increases. That is the, uh, I'm, maybe I should have been a, a, a banker. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene, if I can just maybe comment on that if you don't mind. Yeah? Please Andrew, please. Yeah, just from a, from a property perspective, I, I think this COVID story and the, the sort of six month process that we've been through and where we're going to in terms of after lockdown and after level two and level one, what's critical in terms of our country is starting to market internally. So marketing from a tourism point of view and get our country buoyant in terms of our attitude towards our own country and start with tourism, start getting people to go see the beautiful places that we've got in our country, go have a good uh, tourism experience. The next step in the process to me is then to market internationally and assuming that our borders open up, get the international tourists into our country, get the job creation side going from a tourism front perspective, start getting the spend back into our country and be proactive in that regard. And the trick is really the minute people travel and start moving to specific areas and they have a good experience, they then invest in that area. And that's our ability, especially along our coastline. We've got great products, south coast, north coast, inland from us, in the Drakensberg, KwaZulu-Natal, Western Cape, some fantastic coastal properties. And there is a genuine movement that's starting to happen from inland down to the coast, where people have quickly realized they can work from anywhere in the world. And with the virtual opportunities that are available, home offices have become very important in terms of building of new homes, et cetera, et cetera. So I just feel, you know, we can look at the economy, but critical to us is how we market to our own people and how we market to the rest of the world going forward. Thank you. If I may come in good here, point. Mark, uh, would you allow me to? Uh, I would just make. A, I would just like to make the point. This is not political. I mean, the government did very well in managing this COVID nineteen, apart from a few stupid uh, 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 things here and there said by. Uh, one or two persons, but uh, this is not politics. Um, this has got very little to, to do in the medium term with the growth of our, of our economy. It's naturally they are going to open up the borders. We all know that. Um, uh, it's going to come, uh, but at the moment it is still important to control COVID. So this is not the political problem. 
the political problem is far deeper. Yeah, listen, I think that they, we, we, we haven't even touched on, on the, the political infighting that's definitely been around and, and, and sort of all of those arguments. I think that I, I want to move and just change tack ever so slightly. I want to go back to some of that consumer confidence that we were speaking about a little bit earlier, because there's, there's, there's been some positive conversation and definitely some negative conversation that's happened through the day. And I want to go across to John, because John's, John's genuinely seeing that consumer confidence. We're, 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 you know, if it's resulting in the results that we're seeing from, from Remax's side, then there is some consumer confidence with all of the stuff going wrong or right in terms of how they were dealt with COVID. The load shedding is an issue that's not going to go away in the near future. The, the, in, the political infighting that does seem to exist seems to be a problem that's going to stay with us for a little while. And it is, seems to, there seems to be some traction to deal with it, but we don't know what that looks like in the very near future. There's a lot happening internationally in terms of the big political field, but there is a genuine consumer confidence that exists. And that consumer confidence is seen. I mean, not even John was talking about if it was better than what they were, they were anticipated. I'd, I'd love to try and understand where that's coming from, because if that's just the positive nature of South Africans, then cool, then let's, let's live with it and embrace that. But I'd love to hear from John a little bit inside sort of from your side, please. Well, Eugene, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to say there's an overall confidence. I don't think so. Um, there's a, you know, property residential, say, for instance, is a credit driven thing. Um, and so big interest rate cutting can fuel confidence in that sector, which in, you know, with regards to buying, because uh, typically, uh, you know, residential buyers, they don't think of too much longer term than where interest rates are now. One day interest rates will rise, but that's not the problem now. Um, if you look at the FNB Consumer Confidence Index, BR does it for them. Um, still a very poor number, well into the minuses. Slightly better than where it was during the lockdown, which it, it should be, but, but you know, the third quarter number was still a very weak number. So I, don't, I can't, can't say that there's an overall consumer confidence. And if you look at FNB estate agent surveys, quite a high level generally of, of immigration related selling, which is a, speaks to longer term future confidence in the, in the country, I believe, which is, you know, those numbers are not good. So it's, you know, I, I think what we're seeing now is just really the, the impact of the stimulus packages, massive stimulus from Treasury, quantitative easing and all those things that typically are not seen or haven't been seen in the past as sound and sustainable economic policy. And they're not sustainable. You can't, you can't dole out the money like the Saab has. Um, somewhere along the line, you'll just run into hyperinflation and all the disasters that brings. And you can't have low interest rates like this forever and just try and fuel credit driven spending either. But so, so I think it's a very narrow sort of, you know, where, where credit is the big deal, it's become a lot cheaper and therefore there's a surge in home buying. But I, I, I don't see, you know, if you look at objective surveys, FNB Consumer Confidence Index is not showing a good number. Um, still waiting for the third quarter to uh, estate agent survey to see what immigration related selling is. But for a good couple of years now, that's been quite high. So I don't, I don't quite think it's there. I want to open up to the panel because I mean, I think if we can bring this back to property and I'm going to start with Pat, how does, how does a buyer almost project or protect themselves from, from what's happening? You know, if you, if you're in the market now and you're taking advantage of the low interest rate, getting involved in a, in a deal that you can get onto, even though there's quite a few people, how does, what are the things that one can do that, that, that a person can do to protect themselves going forward and using almost the property investment as a way of protecting what they, what they, what they're doing and how they, if you can give us some insights, if that make any sense there, Pat. You're on, you're on mute there, Pat. Pat, you're on mute, eh? I don't think you can, because I don't think that we know what's going, going to happen going forward, to be honest. Um, so, you know, there's some people that want to fix a rate, John, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a thought. Maybe, you know, we know that the rate will go up some, at some stage. Maybe fix it. But we're not sure when. So there are risks and we work those numbers out and maybe it's not a good time. Uh, there's still a talk maybe of a, another 0.25 drop. I, I, I don't know. So there's not much you can do. Um, but I, I always say, you know, it's like the second hand car market. If you ever want to sell your house, it's not about how much, it's how well you bought in the beginning. When you, if you buy badly, you, you battle to sell or to create the investment. 
And a lot of the times, guys, make a mistake. We saw it during the last recessionary time, you know, in the, 10 years ago, when, when people just bought frantically. And then 10 years later, want to sell. And they've, they've overpaid a long time ago. And that's when they really battle. But I want to go back just before I go there, Eugene, if I can make a point on what was being said about the economy. And I, I agreed with Andrew's sentiment, you know. Um, there's, so many, there's so many wonderful little places, little niches. And I wonder if those aren't being discovered more now than ever before, you know, down the Plett Nice in the George Mossel Bay area, down the north coast, beautiful places that, that, that have kind of laid dormant for people. And, and, and you sense that there's been a value change amongst many people, even amongst us on the panel. Our values have changed as to what we want to achieve in our, in our lives. Suddenly families become more important. So many you, so suddenly your, your, your living area, your entertainment area becomes more highlighted than ever before. That, that 60 or 55 year old guy is looking down the road to where he's going to retire. His values have changed. And COVID has highlighted that. And we're starting to see more and more people looking down that road than ever before. Before we were very driven as to make money. And suddenly people realized, you know what? I can lose the whole damn lot in the space of two or three months. No matter how good or how strong my business was, that can end. And those values struck home. And I think that's driving a, a large portion of the market. In terms of the government, I know Erwin said um, he, he was happy that they managed it pretty well. I have to differ. I think they managed it extremely badly. And I think they created such panic in the market. I mean, look what's happened down in the Western Cape, down in the wine area. I mean, the amount of people that are employed and they that was an absolute disaster. And that's linked to tourism. It was linked to the local economy. It, it's created mayhem in, in that area. And um, that hasn't been good for our business. And that's got a knock-on effect. And they, you know, the, the cigarette banning was, that lost billions then. So I can't see how they, anyone can ever justify that this, this was well managed. I mean, maybe people, less people died, but that, that we all knew was gonna happen. And, and going forward, I, I think that if they just have less, less impact on us, I think we'll be okay. You know, I think that the economy will, will slowly, that pendulum will slowly come back again and come back to some sort of a norm. But it's not going to be the old norm where we rush out and, and, and meet people in restaurants and have parties. And that. I think it's going to be with us for two years. But our values have changed. And people have realized that their living space is quite important now, in, in, as, as in the past, you know. And that has changed. And John, I'm sure FNB are seeing that very much so. And, 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 and all credit to the banks because they've, They've really stepped up to the plate and made sure that this, this industry is cooking at the moment. And I'm, and I'm loving it. Beth, thank you. John, I was going to go back to John. There. You, you mentioned something about the fixing of the rates um, uh, pattern. We just had a question now. What, what is the advice for, for purchases um, from, a, from a bank point of view? Should people look at fixing rates? What does that mean? I mean, uh, I mean, how long can you genuinely fix those rates for to make it work in your favor now if you're, if you're going to try to take advantage of it? Look, I never advise people to fix or not to fix because a lot of people that ask me that question, they're trying to beat the market. And on average, you, you don't beat the forward market with, with fixed rates. You're paying a price for a, you know, to, to get certainty over a certain part of your cash flows. That's the advantage of fixed rates. And on average, the clients who fix rates pay a, pay a premium for it. But um, if, if you are risk averse, if you want to fix rates, um, I would say when rates are this low, and I haven't looked at the forward rate curves to which fixed rates are linked, but um, I'm suspecting that a significant part of the market still expects possible further rate cuts given yesterday's GDP figure. And when the market expectation is down or for very low rates to continue for quite a time, fixed rates on offer are normally pretty good. So, you know, if you, if you are interested in fixed rates, now is a time to, to, I would say it's a good time to think of it. Um, just, on a, just on another, you know, to, to, to talk to, especially, you know, perhaps inexperienced residential investors, and I'm not a big residential investor, I'm just, you know, this is more a, an economist exercise for me, but, but, you know, the one thing I've seen in property over the years, and, and you know, you're talking about, you were talking about how can you protect yourself? It's about your set of skills with property. And, and for, for many you know, people I've known even, that's been sorely lacking. They've seen residential property as I buy a property and it's a, this, this income just flows in. It's, I, I, it's a passive sort of thing. I don't really have to work at it. And that's not, that's not correct. You know, the, the, then you see the real good 
property investors and building managers who have managed buildings successfully in inner city places where angels fear to tread. So, you know, property investment is not just about where the market goes and it's not just about how good the area is or how decaying the area is. Um, you know, I've, uh, it's, it's about your set of skills in managing, understanding this environment, knowing your legal rights and obligations and how to navigate that legal system and managing tenants well. Um, that's, to me, three quarters of the battle when you're investing in property. It's not, it's not just about where the market's going to go. It's about your set of skills. John, I think that's a very good, a very good point. I mean, it's something that we've realized. And I'm going to go across to Ezra because this is, a, this is obviously a space that he does play. In. Now, from our side with their store property, we, we realized very early on that there was a, a massive missing link in terms, of, in terms of information about property and property purchasing. Um, we set up a, a big masterclass that's running on the 14th of October, where we hope to get a huge amount of sort of people on, and hopefully the guys in the, on, the, on this panel will also share their views and, and, and join us as, as panelists for that seminar. And really, it's a, it's a, it's a half-day seminar that allows us to really unpack buying a house for first-time homeowners, and what are the pitfalls, and what should you be looking out for? We do need a lot more of that stuff in the, in the, in the, in the, in the tube, tube for access for, for buyers, so that they can get information, so it's not sort of hidden away. And I'm going to go across to Ezra. Ezra, this is something that you guys have been involved in for a while now, in terms of trying to pass or impart knowledge to, to home buyers. and uh, you know, what are you doing in that space at the moment? 100%. No, thanks a lot, uh, Eugene, for asking the question. First of all, I wanted to, to start with uh, uh, the question you asked, uh, Pat and John as well, about how do, you, how do investors or, or buyers protect themselves in the market? So I want to say that, um, just to support what John is saying, just get educated. You know, get educated. We do, you know, come with this live stream just as well. Get training on how to, to buy, uh, you know, go to all the online trainings that are there that are available to you as well. And also get a mental coach, somebody who was work for somebody who's been doing this thing for a while. And um, you can be able to lend the ropes. I think that will also help you as well, especially if you are focusing on investing or if you're actually trying to sell or anything else that you're trying to do. Work for people who already been in the, in the market for, for a while as well. And um, if you're running your numbers right now, I don't think you should use the interest rates that are cut at 7%. You must try to use 10% or something because they're probably going to be going back in 18 to 24 months. But John should be the right person to tell us when, um, if he has any idea about that. And also know that our government is not going to fix our economy. It's not going to rebuild our economy. Um, our, our government, this is saying, I think it's uh, one of the uh, um, uh, American presidents saying, uh, ask not what the government would do or the country would do for you, but ask what you can do for the country. So I think this is the right time to actually be thinking about that as well, to say, how can I be somebody who's contributing to, you know, uh, the, 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 the people who are building the economy right now? And also familiarize yourself with prop tech. You know, there's been a lot of or countless amount of technology that's been coming up. Uh, due to the COVID right now. And uh, as you can see right now, we are on Zoom. These things don't usually happen on Zoom. Um, so this is actually part of the, the, the proof that technology has been forced into our faces, into our homes. There's some technologies that have been out there for a long time. And I think that um, a lot of us who have been, uh, what do you call this thing? Have been, um, let's just say, not, not overlooking them, basically. That's a good way. Overlooking them uh, and not actually taking advantage of of them to digitalize some of the processes and uh, also to also help uh, taking out the guesswork out, you know, out of the guesswork that's happening when you're doing investments, when you're running numbers as well. So that's something that uh, people can also focus on and try to invest in to understanding one of those technologies that they can take advantage of. So they can stop doing the mundane tasks that are wasting time and focus on actually closing deals, you know, and also building portfolios and building wealth because that's what this property game is about. And I wanted to say, um, in closing, what are we doing on a daily basis? We've been doing live streams like yourself since April. And um, also we have like um, blog posts that we publish weekly about property. We even try to give advice on different uh, aspects about investing in property, coaching, you know, finding deals, renting versus buying and all that stuff. There's a lot of them you guys can find it on the website. And uh, also we're also having like an online summit, which is like a five day summit uh, where we bring like PropTech founders together in one week just to figure out how you can digitize your real estate business today because Digitizing is something that's going to be very important, either from selling, from buying, from management, and also from the business to, you know, doing your market research as well, and also finding some of the tools that I can be able to help you take out the guest work when you're running your numbers. So you say you found a deal somewhere, and you want to know, does it make money, does it not, you know, um, what are they, you know, what's going on in the area as well. Those are the other tools that we're bringing uh, together to help you take out the guesswork, to help you, you know, stop procrastinating and focus on 
you know, closing deals and just building wealth rather than just doing the mundane tasks. Because some of the things can be digitized simply. And also, uh, the, the big question there was, you know, we were not prepared for what's going on right now in this pandemic. And um, so we, we just sat down and asked everybody, what would you do uh, in your business today to be prepared for the next pandemic? Should we have the next one? And this is why we all bring everybody in one week just to think about all these ideas and uh, bring all these tools that can help you bring your business online as well. And uh, so you can be able to operate, especially right now, because everybody's working from home and things are, uh, I don't think things are going to be going back to normal, like normal, normal that we used to do. Things are going to be going forward rather. And uh, as we go forward, we need to be ready. And uh, whatever we learn from this pandemic, I think the biggest thing is to just to learn all the time, come to this live streams, go to trainings, go to everywhere and, and learn and learn and be ready. Um, and who's better to learn from than experts like here, the people who are already involved in the, the game and also other people who are both already involved in the prop tech that can be able to help you navigate in the COVID era of investing. So I just um, wanted to say um, that's what we're doing right now and also inviting everybody who's interested in that to join us on the online real estate summit. I think Candice will send you guys the link somewhere there. And um, you know, we, we, we definitely know that you guys are going to need help. Um, uh, when it, this is going to take a lot of work to really make right decisions in property, uh, registering and investing. And uh, we are here to help you guys. We've been putting this thing together for a while right now. And we officially launching it on the 28th of September. And we want you guys to be part of it and part of, you know, the change that's happening right now in real estate and digitizing the whole uh, real estate industry. Now, thanks a lot, uh, Eugene. I think that's uh, my two cents there. <laughs> Thank you, Ezra. So let's see, we've got to the top of the hour. We're almost there. So um, we're going to start wrapping up. Um, now we wanted to try and bring these, uh, these Let's Talk properties back to you one hour. Um, hey, oh, Pat, sorry, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I just want to make a uh, backup, John. John, uh, your point was so well made about um, you know, understanding what you're doing, you know, and, and the expertise that's needed. And we see it so often, buyers of property that don't understand the full financial impact of the add-ons, the little extras that that really can 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 put you in a, in, in trouble. It's not just the actual property, but it's the upkeep, it's the it's the registration costs, it's it's the rates, it's the all of that as a package. And so often um, we don't see buyers not understanding that too well. Um, and 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 I think that's where a really good estate agent plays a role, uh, as opposed to just you know buying offline and not online and not really knowing knowing what's going on. So a, a, a very good point. And in terms of commercial property, I mean, that's, that's the essence of commercial property is managing it, understanding it, how to do rezonings. You know, how often have you seen uh, good things being done by just a, a smart person who understands how to, how to buy commercial property, how to fill it, how to rezone it, how to package it, as opposed to just buying and you know, hoping it's going to happen. It doesn't work that way. And, it's a, and you need expertise in, in that field. So a, a really good point, mate, John. Very good point. Thank you. And I definitely I, I emulate exactly what you're saying. So I'm going to start with Andrew and just quickly whip around and give everybody a bit of a closing chance to sort of wrap up from today. I know that it, uh, this hour went by very, very quickly and we've covered quite a lot. Um, I think from my side, thank you again to the panel. It's, uh, I've learned a massive amount in terms of the conversation. Um, there were a couple of areas that, I, that we didn't touch on, but I think we've covered quite a lot. And uh, this is probably one of those subjects that will be back again in the, the future. Um, I'm very glad that we've collaborated a bit more with Ezra and for a bit more collaboration in the future. But Andrew, if uh, we can hand over to you for, for some closing from your side, please. Yeah, Eugene, thanks very much. And thanks again to all the panelists. I've really enjoyed this morning. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, just from my side, I'd really love to see government spending money in the right areas, uh, eradicate the corruption side of things, and uh, that needs to be taken very seriously. What's critical for our country is obviously safety, security, and stability. And uh, I think over and above that, the bulk service delivery, uh, John and Erwin highlighted it as a big concern, and uh, we need to move to communities where that is guaranteed. And Sometimes you might look towards gated communities, uh, especially along this North Coast region. I know uh, Elan is doing some great development opportunities there. Maybe those are the guaranteed type of infrastructure that, you, that you're looking for at the end of the day. I think so important for our country is, is community living and integrated living. And anyone that has a model of that sort of nature that can promote it to the rest of the country through government circles, I think will uh, add massive kudos to what is needed in our country specifically. I touched on earlier, Eugene, the, 
the, the great effect of tourism in our country and whether it's done locally, whether it's a, a broadcasting to an international community over time, we need to get our tourism back online and attract investors into our country, not only internationally, but also locally. And I really appreciate today. I hope people can become creative and responsible and look forward to future panel discussions with yourselves. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much for joining. We really do wish uh, you well, and uh, we wish you very well with EXP and the, and the big changes that are coming to, to, to you in this industry from your side. And we look forward to big, better things from you and uh, a lot more conversation around Black Bell um, with yourself in particular. Erwin, I'm going to give it a chance just to wrap up from your side if you, if you can. Well, from my side, property is a long-term investment. As was said before, we all know that. So it is important not to be short-sighted. It's important to take a medium-term view when you uh, invest in property as an investment as opposed to a place to stay. Um, so uh, I think that's about it. And I think a very, very, very important point. It is a long-term investment, and that's exactly what it is that we want to encourage people to look at. And uh, yeah, thank you, Erin, and thank you very much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Your insights are always important for us. I'm going to move across to, to Ezra. Ezra, it was great to meet you yesterday and today, and thank you for being part of it. And if you can just give us some of your closing shots. I know you almost did it uh, just before we went around the, the book around, but if you can just close from your side, please. No, thanks a lot, Eugene, and I'm uh, very excited and thankful for being part of the panelists today. I wanted to say, um, as Owen said, uh, property is a long-term game, and uh, it's going to require a lot of work as well. And uh, it's going to take you guys um, or everybody else to be well-informed and being able to make the right decisions, especially in the market that is changing right now uh, with COVID and with the recessions and everything that's going on right now. And um, as I had, I think uh, the one pattern I had today was that this is the come before the storm. Um, so we sort of, uh, um, we can have a doom and gloom of view to say, okay, things might get worse or things might have been worse for, for most people as well. But I think uh, there are some people who are going to come on top of what's going on right now. And I think um, you guys must be, the guys who are watching must be part of uh, those people who are doing that as well. And the only way to do that is just to keep learning, uh, keep uh, getting well informed and keep coming to this session as well. And uh, we also invite you guys to be part of the summit that we also hold, hosting as well, because we're going to be touching on what's going to be happening in terms of post rent, uh, COVID rental market and a lot of other different aspects of what's going on right now. So you can be able to navigate um, um, the COVID era right now because COVID has changed a, a lot of things. And I know a lot of uh, people started this year saying 2020 is my year, it's 2020. <laughs> and the COVID happened. So um, let's keep it 2020, guys. We can still do it uh, with the right mindset, with the right information and uh, with the right attitude as well. So. We are also happy to help you guys where we can, and uh, we're looking forward to working with a lot of you guys. Uh, and also, we're looking forward to having you guys for the visual summit that's going to be hosted uh, by the Elon Group as well. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, Ezra. Stay positive, stay property. So we'll uh, we'll keep going in that particular space. John, just from your side, um, if you can just give us some of your closing comments, that would really help. Thank you. Eugene, I think realistically, given economic policy as it is, and economic management as it is, given lack of capex and the, the ESCOM issues. We, we know all these well-documented issues. Realistically, we're probably in a stagnant economy for quite some years to come. And I believe it could get quite turbulent um, because I think we're on the road to the next big political change. And that's normally a rough process in this part of the world. Uh, difficult to say what that political change will be, but I think we're on our path to it. So, um, you know, but, but, Good business people, good investors, good property people don't necessarily make money when everything's stable and certain and everything's tried everything there is to try. Everyone's tried everything. Um, they make money by, they've got to take risk, um, but they also, the, the successful ones are the people who understand what they're dealing with, whether it's a rough neighborhood or, or a, a good neighborhood. It's ones that don't try to pretend. They understand exactly what they're dealing with the tenant they're dealing with, the property, the area, et cetera, et cetera. And when you've got a stagnant economy, which will ultimately, I think, lead to a stagnant market, um, there's, it's always important to realize that there's structural changes going on within that stagnant economy. A big structural change talked about at the moment, for instance, is remote work. Okay, 
um, which is widely expected to come on a much larger scale. And that has implications, positive implications for the clever guys in property. What's going to be done with all this surplus office space? Already there's high vacancy rates in places like Santa. What are we going to do with it? Um, how are households going to live now? Is it bigger properties? Is it more in small country towns? Is it out in Potjeström because I don't have to commute into Joburg that often? And I don't pretend to know the answer to these questions. I think there's more questions than answers at the moment. And the answers will come in the coming months and few years. But the, the guys who are going to make good money out of this are the clever guys who are going to understand these unfolding trends. Um, there's, uh, you know, uns the uncertainty and the change is what creates the opportunities. And even though there's a stagnant overall economy, there is radical change taking place at the moment and the clever guys are going to benefit from that. John, as, as usual, I think that you've left us with, uh, with a very true and a very impactful sort of uh, thought, you know, and I think that's important. So thank you. We really do value the time. We value what yourself has done. It does. And obviously from the F&B side, um, you know, just, just within the whole property market, uh, we really want to thank you and thank them in particular. So thank you for, the, for, for your parting shots there. Thanks, Pat, as the, as the final batsman uh, to come in today, if you can sort of... Uh, I think end on the positivity you started with and that uh, if we can get your sort of uh, your, your parting shots, please. And you're on mute, I bet. I do think that we're in for some turbulent times. There's no doubt about that. We can see what's the impact of, of, of retrenchments and, and the government and corruption and whatever. But I think that cash flow is going to be king going forward. Cash flow, what you manage your cash flow well, um, and those ones that can come through with cash over the next year or so will we'll, we'll benefit the strong companies and the strong individuals that have been able to leverage. And if you can leverage, and that's, that's the advantage of having bought property a long time ago, maybe you can leverage. But cash flow will be king going forward. Um, stay positive, support local, and um, I'm sure that we'll get through this thing together. Um, I've no doubt uh, we've been through tougher times as a country before. And I've no doubt we'll pull through this over the next year or two. Thank you, Pat. And I mean, I think you highlighted about the 26% uh, uh, um, sort of the charges in the past. And we did, we all survived that. And there was property movement over that period of time. So this is uh, probably just another walk in that same park. And we'd be looking Eugene, back at this over a period Eugene, of time. Eugene, do you remember, John? I'm sure you remember the 92, 93 period. <laughs> we were going through some rough times in South Africa, man. Politically, was, in every way you could even think of. We weathered the storm, and today we, we find ourselves in a similar position. I've no doubt we'll pull through it again. And, and luckily, I do remember because I'm old enough to remember, which is a bit of a horrible thing. And uh, <laughs> it was it was a turbulent time, and we definitely made it through there. So thank you. And uh, we guys from from uh, real estate investor and from Eden Property Group, we really want to thank everybody that's been part of this. We really want to thank you for the time and the effort that you guys have put into being in these panels every week. Uh, we will be back next week. Please keep an eye out for the, for the topic. We're working on that at the moment in the background. And uh, tomorrow we'll send out that mail so that everyone knows the next topic that we'll be talking to. I really want to highlight uh, again uh, the 14th of October in terms of the, the, the half-day seminar that we're putting together. And that's really for first-time home buyers that are buying in this particular space. And I think we've mentioned it a few times today that education is very important. And I think we've got to do the hard jobs to make sure that we inform ourselves in terms of how we can be buying. That's also going to lead across to what we're going to have on the 11th of November. On the 11th of November, we're going to have an international property market that we are running. And this is really for those people that are looking wider and abroad. And I think that uh, Ezra highlighted the world's got a lot smaller. All of a sudden, we are doing things digitally. Um, you know, we can now purchase overseas and do and own property in all over the world at the moment. Uh, we have an American company that's operating right here with Futomo. So, you know, the, the world has become a huge, a, a, lot, a lot smaller in terms of where it is. And we want to try and highlight what it's like buying overseas in the, in the international market as well. So we look forward to seeing you, all, you guys again next week. Same time, same place. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we're just going to leave with a little bit of uh, video from our side. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next week.
I'm Derek Watts. Blythedale Coastal Estate is Africa's first eco-smart city. 80% off-grid, solar power, desalination plant, fiber to the home and 5G Wi-Fi. Holistic Estate app. Smart Estate Utility Management. Smart Home. 1,000 hectares of inclusive mixed-use development. Eco-design guidelines. Six kilometers of beach and river frontage. 320 hectares of indigenous forest. Cheers for now and I hope you'll join me as a neighbor in the Blythedale Coastal Estate community.